I'd just like to uh, welcome our guest speaker here. Um, I'm Brian Penny from the office of the CTO. And uh, I just wanted to introduce our, our guest speaker. He's a recognized technology expert, a sought after speaker, and an award winning business author who's written over six books in his career. He consults companies on how to optimize their use of technology and focuses on the interaction of people, management, data, and technology. His contributions have been featured in Harvard Business Review, CNN, the New York Times, Wired, NBC, as well as many other high profile media outlets. And his latest his latest book, The Visual Organization, Data Visualization, Big Data, and the Quest for Better Decisions, also included Autodesk's org, org chart. He's flown in all the way from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, so please put your hands together and welcome our guest speaker, Phil Simon. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, good. Thank you, Autodesk. Happy Monday. I'm Phil, and I've written a bunch of books, one of which won an award. Uh, when I'm not um, writing, I'm speaking and helping companies make sense of big data and data visualization technology. And on a personal level, I'm a huge fan of the show Breaking Bad. But more on that later. Contest. Who's this guy? Anybody? Reed Hastings. There's a book or another one. <laughs> Thank you. You're the first person to get it. I guess everybody knows Hastings in some way, but not necessarily the picture. And in previous books, I've covered Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and Twitter. But one could make the argument that of all the companies that are doing, quote unquote, big data, none does it better than Netflix. But don't listen to me. Here's some data on Netflix. 40 million customers as of a couple weeks ago, the vast majority of, of whom stream the service. Interesting story, when Hastings co-founded the company, he called it Netflix, long before broadband was as pervasive. Essentially, he knew that eventually he would disintermediate himself. There'd be no need to send out disks. Nearly a $27 billion market cap. And this is a fascinating stat, responsible for nearly one third of all US weeknight internet traffic. This is why, to Netflix, net neutrality is such a big deal. Imagine if the ISPs like Comcast started charging more for Netflix, all of a sudden you're not paying $8 a month. More flat facts on Netflix. This one's also really interesting. Netflix uses Amazon Web Services, AWS. Uh, AWS is something like a $5 billion a year business inside of Amazon, and it's growing at 40 to 50% a year. Netflix uses AWS more than Amazon itself. That blew my mind when I read it, I believe, in Wired. When there's a problem with AWS, more often than not, a techie over at Netflix doesn't just log a ticket and say, help us. It'll be more like, no, you need to fix this line of code. It needs to be whatever. Now, relying upon Amazon and AWS is sort of a double-edged sword. On one hand, think about the money that Netflix can save not having to build billion-dollar data centers, right? They're not cheap. On the other hand, what happens when Netflix goes down? And it has nothing to do with Netflix. It has everything to do with AWS. And point of fact, this happened. Anyone remember this? Christmas Day, 2012? Right? Well, what do you want to do on Christmas Day? You don't want to talk to your family. Right? You want to watch TV shows and movies. But you couldn't do that because there was a very technical glitch in AWS. And as a result, people started venting on Twitter, right? Netflix hashtag fail. Had nothing to do with Netflix and everything to do with AWS. Netflix is quite the disruptive company. Um, many people are cutting cords, or now I, I heard that there's something like 5 million cord nevers, essentially people who never had cable. And in September of 2013, Netflix, some of you may know, show of hands, anyone here a fan of House of Cards? Okay, decent number of people. Netflix actually became the first non-TV network to win an Emmy for House of Cards. And it's also getting into other original programming like Orange is the New Black. So Netflix is doing some really interesting things. The obvious question to me is how? We're living in this world of big data, but as I've seen in my years as a consultant and having done a lot of research and talked to a lot of people, not a lot of companies are doing a great deal with data. 
you can put Netflix in that other category. Netflix, I would argue, is actually the, the exception that proved the rule. And in researching the book, I came across a three-part data credo at Netflix, Netflix. The first of which is that data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. Netflix is tracking just about everything. In other words, this isn't simply a matter of you happen to select orange is the new black. They know when you start, they know when you pause, they know when you leave. All of those things are being tracked. But forget for a minute all the data that 40 million customers generate. Netflix realizes that there are limitations to even that vast trove of information. And Netflix purchases an, exclusive, an extensive amount of third-party metadata from firms like Nielsen, which is a global information and measurement company. In other words, Netflix realizes that as much data as it has, it can do better with more data. But this is also interesting. There's only so much that computers can do. Right? Algorithms are interesting, and they can tell us really insightful things, whether you're Google or Netflix or Amazon. But at Netflix, they actually pay people to watch movies. I find this fascinating. This isn't simply a matter of going, yeah, what do you think about Glen Gary, Glen Ross? They train people for two to three days, have them watch movies, and they're looking for very specific attributes. And in a little while, I'm going to tell you what they do with some of that information. So forget the data that Netflix generates or the, the data that Netflix purchases. It talks to actual people and tries to generate more data that way. And because of that, Netflix can move beyond simple genres, comedies like any Arrested Development fans here? Hey, come on. <laughs> we can move well beyond comedies. Now note the orange color of Arrested Development because I'm going to come back to that. And dramas and westerns, documentaries, right? Those are table stakes at Netflix. There was an interesting article about a month ago from a guy in the Atlantic about how Netflix can take the data that it has and has actually generated, I'm not making this up, 77,000 different subgenres of movies. For example, dark, suspenseful sci-fi horror movies. OK, I suppose that's reasonable. Gritty, suspenseful revenge westerns. In other words, when Netflix is paying people to watch movies, they're having them to determine if it's actually suspenseful. Neither of which is to be confused with romantic Indian crime dramas. I can't name one, but evidently that's a subgenre at Netflix. This one baffles me. Evil kid horror movies. <laughs> this is a subgenre at Netflix. Visually striking goofy action and adventures. And then finally, violent suspenseful action and adventure from the 1980s. Which begs the question, I guess that subgenre exists from the 1970s. So Netflix generates a lot of data. The second part of the credo is the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. Many organizations are trying to grab information, but how many of them actually can do something with it in real time? I would argue not that many. At Netflix, they embrace data more than just about any company out there. Um, there's a great quote I discovered in the book from um, James Barksdale, who was one of the founders of Netflix, I'm sorry, of uh, Netscape. And the quote is, um, if we have data, let's use that. Otherwise, let's use my opinion. <laughs> and because Netflix has all this information, it knows an incredible amount about its customers. For example, anybody know who this is? Walter White. Brian Cranston as Walter White. For those of you who are not a fan of the show Breaking Bad, Walter White plays a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And his wife is pregnant, sort of an unexpected pregnancy, and his teenage son has cerebral palsy. Goes to the doctor one day after collapsing, working at his second job, a car wash. And the doctor tells him, you have terminal lung cancer and six months to live. Now, he works as a high school chemistry teacher. If you've got six months to live and don't want to burden your family with a lot of debt from medical bills and college tuition, et cetera, what do you do? Well, of course, you start manufacturing crystal meth. This is my favorite show of all time. I um, should probably have an affiliate link on my website or something because I'm always recommending it. But why am I talking about Breaking Bad? 
because Netflix knows that 50,000 of its customers watched all 13 episodes of season four the day before season five premiered. They call it binge viewing. And Aaron Paul, who's on the show, who plays uh, sort of lovable druggy um, Jesse Pinkman, said that people had gone up to him and said, I watched in season three all three episodes one weekend. Now, if you do the math on watching 35 episodes, 45 minutes each over a weekend, you're really not sleeping. But that's the way the show is. And Netflix has all this information, and it uses this information to make, I would argue, more informed business decisions. This isn't just with Breaking Bad, though. Um, Netflix is in the original content business now. And there's a guy by the name of Ted Sarandos at Netflix who serves as the chief content officer. Now, in many companies, titles get inflated. But at Netflix, if you're the chief content officer, that's actually a really big deal. Because if you ne look at Netflix's financial statements, they spend a tremendous amount of money on content, whether it's original content, Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, Lilyhammer, but also licensing comment, content from, say, AMC, which produced Breaking Bad. And a reporter asked Sarandos, aren't you afraid that if you spend $100 million on original content, like 13 episodes of season one of House of Cards, that people will pay $8, binge view right, all 13 episodes, and then quit. Remember, this is not an annual contract or a two-year contract like you have with an AT&T or Verizon. With Netflix, you're monthly. It's kind of like they're in this building, salesforce.com. Right? You pay for essentially as long as you want it with a one-month commitment. When asked the question, I Sarandos didn't say, we hope that doesn't happen, we don't think it's happening, or that's a really good question. He brought out the data and at a, just without batting an eye said, only 8,000 of our customers did that. Now, 8,000 is a big number, but on top of 40 million, not so much. So Netflix knows a tremendous amount about its customers. And the third part of the credo is whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. That's the part that I want to focus on today because my book, The Visual Organization, takes a look at Netflix and other organizations and shows how they are actually visualizing data and making better business decisions. Does anyone recognize this man? Kevin Spacey, right? Uh, these are four of my very favorite Kevin Spacey movies. Uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, amazing movie, one of my top five. Uh, the Usual Suspects, he won Best Supporting Actor for that. Seven, he plays John Doe, a serial killer. It's a different role for him. And then finally, he won the Oscar as Lester Burnham in American Beauty, another amazing film. His current project is House of Cards. Um, anyone see House of Cards just out of curiosity? OK, a couple hands. As I mentioned before, Netflix spent $100 million on 13 episodes of House of Cards. But remember, Netflix doesn't think like a traditional television network or traditional Hollywood company. I'm no expert, but from what I understand, if you want to pitch a show, you need a pilot. Right? Netflix said flat out, don't need one. We like Kevin Spacey. Uh, David Fincher, who directed Fight Club, who directed the first couple of episodes of House of Cards, they said, we believe in the project, but we also have the data to not completely eliminate risk, but manage that risk. If you think about it, Netflix actions really weren't that crazy because it had the data. Now, this is the cover of House of Cards. Kevin Spacey looks very authoritative on the show. He plays, someone mentioned before, Frank Underhill, who's um, Secretary of State, I believe, on the show in season one. And then I don't want to spoil it for everyone, but he moves up. And Kevin Spacey's 50-ish, 52. Um, this cover is actually very similar to another color. And this is Patrick Stewart in Macbeth. Now, Patrick Stewart's a few years older, but visually, these are very similar covers. In fact, um, the actors look a bit alike. Kevin Spacey, I think, is wearing a hairpiece. But like me, Patrick Stewart is follically challenged. So these covers look very similar. And someone at Netflix decided to say, well, how similar? And here you go. At Netflix, they actually quantify the colors on the cover imagery. 
So House of Cards isn't just black and Macbeth is black. They literally break it down into the different hues. So maybe you happen to like dramas that have black covers. And maybe you like comedies with yellow covers. And maybe for you, color doesn't matter at all. The point is that Netflix has the information to make those types of distinctions. Netflix can segment customers. And when you think about it, the numbers get kind of scary. If you've got 77,000 different subgenres of movies and TV shows, and you start to throw colors in, your head could explode. Now, this wasn't just a one-time project at Netflix. They determined that, to some extent, colors move the needle. I mentioned before Arrested Development, which is mostly orange, but there's also some black in there. But Netflix isn't just giving you recommendations based upon what you liked in the different main genres or even subgenres. Um, Netflix is doing things with color to make its algorithm even better. Now, how does Netflix know all this information about its customers? Again, what you watch, that's not that hard. When you watch, OK, again, not necessarily that hard. But I remember Netflix back in 97, 98, and you were really watching on your computer or your DVD player. Well, these days, you have many more choices. If you're streaming, you can watch it on your tablet. You can watch it on your phone, Xbox. Um, keep going with devices. And again, Netflix knows when you pause and when you resume watching. Um, Amazon does this as well. If any of you read eBooks and you're reading, say, uh, on the train, and you're bringing up a book, and you stop on page 37, well, let's say you go back to your Kindle. It knows you're on page 37. The data synchronizes across the devices. Well, so what, right? What does this really mean? In this era of big data, he with the most data doesn't win. In fact, as I argue in the book, and we look at companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and Netflix, success hinges upon what organizations can actually do with this information. Having the data and not doing anything with it really doesn't help you. And I was thinking about how companies like Netflix we're letting people make better decisions. That's how I came across Autodesk and the org org chart project, which if those of you haven't seen, I took it out of this talk because it seems sort of silly to come here and tell you what you already know. But the way you're able to visualize employee movement was actually interesting to me and that people were looking at that. And I used to, as a consultant, design reports for companies. I never designed anything as an interactive data viz like that. It gives you a different window into the organization. So how do we make sense? of all this information and how are progressive companies turning this data into insights? And more important, what can companies learn from the Netflixes of the world? These were very much on my mind. Companies were interacting with data in different ways. But when you think about it, this isn't just something you do at work. Um, if you pay attention, you realize that data and data visualization are actually everywhere these days. Uh, visual employees. Case in point, just look out here. I saw my first 3D printer today. Very cool. Visual consumers. I'll tell you a story in a bit about when I was in Manhattan and saw a dry cleaner that I think understands this notion of a visual organization. Anyone here ever been to data.gov and played around? Open data sets, linked data? OK, a few people. Governments are making more data available. The CDC did some work with flu. There was a little work done a while ago with Google trying to predict flu better than the CDC. And as citizens, we're becoming more visual. I'm going to talk a little bit about visual journalism and data-oriented journalism. People like Nate Silver, who are changing the way that journalism, journalists do their jobs. And then another interesting story on the visual athlete. About nine months ago, I was in Manhattan keynoting a conference on big data and healthcare. And I'm walking down the street in Manhattan. And I took this picture. This is a dry cleaner that presented just a simple bar chart on its Yelp ratings. Think about that. We, we didn't see things. Forget the fact that Yelp didn't exist, to my knowledge, 10 years ago. This simple image to me demonstrates that people are going to walk, what, what is this telling me? And it's a very simple graph, but that communicates it better than just a sign saying, we are the best dry cleaner. These are actual Yelp reviews. Now, this is a tool that Yelp makes available to merchants. But even if you're not a merchant, Yelp makes very simple data viz available to just users. And these are a review, uh, a, 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 this is a chart of reviews from just location for all of my, my Yelp reviews in my history of Yelp usage. 
Looks like I was in Portland, Toronto, and felt so strongly about a place that I decided to review it. But most of my reviews are in either Las Vegas and also West Caldwell, New Jersey, which is where I lived prior to moving to Vegas. But that's just one way to cut the data, right? Just this literally took a couple clicks of my mouse. What categories do I review? Looks like I review a decent number of restaurants, hotels, and travel, OK? My point is that these tools are available to you as citizens and users. It's only natural for us to start using more of these at work. Does anyone know who this is? Anybody? This is Ray Allen. He's a backup guard for the Miami Heat, all-time NBA leader in three-pointers. He will sometimes start when Dwayne Wade is injured. But more sports organizations, more teams, are looking at things in an analytical way. If you've read the book Moneyball, you saw that was sort of the precursor with what Billy Bean did with the Oakland A's. Teams like the Heat are using shot charts. In other words, since Ray Allen is taking a lot of threes, someone said, well, why don't we take a look at where he's taking those threes? Because not all three pointers are created the same. As you see from the red dots, those points on the floor are actually better shots for him. Why take a long two when your odds of making a three-pointer are just a little bit lower, but the payoff's 50% higher? Teams are using this, and far more, in just really interesting ways. This one I'm sure you'll get. Does anyone know who this is? Elon Musk. And here he is showing off the latest Tesla. Anyone see 60 Minutes last night, the profile of Elon Musk? I thought that was interesting. Anyway, in 2013, so about a year ago, Musk unveiled the latest Tesla. And he made certain claims about how well the car drive, drove. Right? Charge, miles, things like that. Well, New York Times reporter, reporter by the name of John Broder questioned some of those claims. And he decided to take a Tesla out for a drive and very carefully document the mileage and the charging. And according to the data that he generated, Musk's claims were wildly optimistic, in fact, flat out false. Now, this wasn't some 15-year-old with a Tumblr blog. Here's a guy who writes for the New York Times. This review is going to have legs. The two went back and forth, Broder and Musk, and it's the first time I can recall that we ever saw a CEO and a reporter arguing about data. I don't think it's going to be the last. If you take a look at what Nate Silver is doing or uh, New York Times, MIT, they're hiring visual journalists. It doesn't mean that you can quantify everything, but we're starting to see that you can quantify more and more, and that trend is only going to intensify with the Internet of Things. Now, I was thinking about this, because this isn't the first book about data visualization. It's not the only book. I read a data visualization book a million years ago when I was in college. But I wondered to myself, where were all the data viz case studies? In other words, many of the books out there on data visualization are theoretical. Here's what you could do. Here's the best way to produce a bar chart or a line chart or a heat map. But when I searched Google for data viz case studies, Here's just a simple data viz of what I found. Something like 23, in quotes, results for data viz case studies. And many of those, or I should say a few, were my blog posts going, where are all the data viz case studies? Com contrast that with ERP, enterprise resource planning, with CRM, customer relationship management. It was astonishing to me that there really weren't that many case studies out there. Now, that doesn't mean that an organization implements a tool to help them with data discovery, and the ROI is going to be 10.2%. I wasn't there, but I sincerely doubt that at Netflix, someone said we're only going to quantify the colors on the movie imagery if the ROI is north of 10%. Right? You don't necessarily know what you're going to find. This notion of big data and a precise ROI, I, th I think, is nonsense. Okay. For those of you who hadn't seen it, this is org org chart. And it showed employee movement over a four-year period at Autodesk. And to me, this was absolutely amazing. Again, as someone who had written a number of reports in his career, I never designed anything like this. And this is a very neat tool, but it's not the only interactive data viz that are out there. I've seen some really neat ones with Twitter data and nodes and clusters and which people were tweeting at which people. So there's a great deal that you can do with data. And as I argue in the book, it's fine if you visualize small data, relatively small amount in a static way. But what happens when you take a 
a large amount of unstructured data and you create tools to let people interact with it. It doesn't necessarily give you the right answer, but maybe it helps you ask better questions. More and more people are interacting with data. Now Autodesk has, I believe, 7,000 employees. Netflix has a bunch. But in reality, this notion of a visual organization does not hinge upon size. In the book, I profile a company called Wedgies based in Las Vegas, and they do social polling. You link to your Twitter account, and you create a very simple poll. But it's a visual poll with images, and they recently added animated GIFs. And that's on the front end. On the back end, when things start to change, since they rely upon AWS, they want a visual. They want an interactive tool that helps them understand what's going on in case they need to up their allotment with Amazon. Even though it's a six-person company, this company's built to scale. If it becomes a 60 or 600 or 6,000 person company, the architecture is built in such a way that you can keep adding more. It's a very visual product and it's built to scale. Um, so what are the, some of the characteristics of a visual organization? Uh, for the most part, they eschew this notion of set it and forget it. About uh, six, seven years ago, I consulted for a utility company in New Jersey, and I built a simple ETL tool, ex extract, transform, and load. Basically takes data from one system and loads it into another. I show up seven years later to help with an upgrade, and I, I noticed this same tool on the woman's screen. I go, did I design that? She goes, yeah. She asked me uh, two questions. Um, I'm sorry, I asked her two questions. Does it still work? Answer, yes. And did you change it? Answer, no. That's very different than the, this era of big data. Five, six years ago, companies started to get their arms around LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. And all of a sudden, Pinterest comes out of nowhere. Uh, the point is that it's not about setting it and forgetting it. Um, we always need to evaluate new sources of information. Many times, you don't know where you're going to go. You can't tell me that Netflix knew that throwing out um, colors into their algorithm would matter. But there's this notion of data exploration. We don't know where the data is going to take us. And don't get me wrong, traditional reporting, KPIs, dashboards, they're not going anywhere. But I would argue that with those tools, you kind of need to know what you're looking for, right? You want to see certain numbers, beds in a hospital filled if you work in healthcare. But they don't necessarily encourage data discovery. Visual organizations aren't afraid to buy and build new tools as necessary. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no product you can buy off the shelf that quantifies the colors for movies. Netflix wind up building it. So what are some of the lessons from the book? We don't want employees to have to go to the IT department every time they want data. I'm old enough to remember when you had to do that. That was very frustrating. It was always a lot of back and forth. You want a user experience that lets people ask questions of their data. Never before through open APIs, it, very easily to visualize a lot of data without being a proper techie. And you want to encourage that. Because with, with experimentation, employees are going to find out interesting things. That's why with the subtitle of the book, it's a quest for better decisions. This isn't simply a five-point checklist. It's also important to walk before you run. This is the third talk that I've given on the new book. It just came out. And some people have said to me after the first couple of talks, you know, well, Google and Netflix can do things, and we're, not, we're nowhere even near there. I agree, but remember, five, 10 years ago, Google couldn't do what it does today. Ditto Netflix. So you have to think of it as more of a journey rather than a sprint. In many organizations, I believe they suffer from what I'll call the quarterly visualization mentality. In other words, they only visualize data for an annual report, uh, for a quarterly meeting. Um, as I researched companies for this book, I found that many people were interacting with their data often on a daily basis. In the book, I also cover the University of Texas. And it's not that their technology is at the Netflix level, but they took a very different approach. Academia can be a very conservative place. And at the University of Texas, they made a tremendous amount of data available to anybody, not just alums or administrators, but anybody with an internet connection can go to the University of Texas productivity dashboard and play around with data. Stuart Brand famously said, I think in 1972, information wants to be free. We are really seeing that these days. What's more, all data is not required to begin. Many organizations won't do anything because they say, well, we don't have all the data. Newsflash, you're never going to have all the data. And new sources will jump at you immediately. Most of these companies understand the importance of iteration. 
In other words, even when I was talking to Justin Macheka from Autodesk, we were talking about org org chart. I said, is this the final copy? I said, no, this evolved and it will continue to evolve because different people will have different ideas. So it's not necessarily a linear path. Sometimes you wind up taking a step back before you wind up where you need to be. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I've got time for about 10 minutes or so of questions if anyone has any. <laughs>